So today, um, John and I are going to talk about reading and writing OME and GFBook formatted images. And I feel I should give some kind of disclaimer. I guess I'll call it for some people. I feel I should give some kind of disclaimer of because this is one of those how to talks where I signed up to speak because I wanted to motivate myself to learn the topic, um, not because I'm an expert in the topic. So feel free to chime in with your comments, opinions, outbursts. Um, and we can make this more of a discussion than a lecture. Do you have any disclaimers to add? <laughs> uh, I'll just add that, like, this, as you can see on the screen, this is um, June 2023. So this is largely the state of the tools at this time, and like, things are moving quickly. And so um, I guess just to be aware that just the state of affairs today has Okay, so we're going to start off with an introduction to like what is OME and GFF, uh, and then I am going to talk about reading and writing with kind of a smattering of tools, and then John will talk about reading and writing in the Fiji ecosystem. So we all know that bioimaging has too many file formats for very sensible, legitimate reasons that I won't go into. Uh, and the open microscopy environment is an organization founded like 20 years ago by a bunch of researchers to address the challenge of standardization in bioimaging. And uh, one of their, I think, earlier projects is this uh, bioformats, which was sort of meant to be like a universal converter from like all of these kind of niche file formats to like more standard file formats. And there's like 160 something supported file formats right now. And it's still, it's still maintained, it's still supported and it's still widely used. But I think at a certain point, OME kind of realized that it was somewhat untenable to keep maintaining, like adding new file formats to bio formats forever. Um, so another kind of tack we've taken is that of creating like a community standard file format. And so the current community standard is OME and GFF, um, which throughout this presentation, I'm going to be using anonymously, synonymously with OME ZAR, um, because right now it's totally baked into the ZAR file format. Um, and their decision to name it OME and GFF rather than OME ZAR is a conversation for another day. Or today, honestly. One, I don't know, I don't know much about it. Yeah. I don't know why they made that choice. I think it was a bad thing. Um, <laughs> so the predecessor to OME ZAR or OME and GFF was OME TIFF. Um, again, still widely used. It's not like it's done. Um, which was essentially a way of formatting a TIFF file according to OMG Virginia community standards. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we've lost the presenter view. We mm -hmm. just see your desktop. And I wouldn't complain about that ordinarily, but some of the text is very small and hard to read like this. Okay. I'm going to I'm gonna keep well, switching right. between like the desktop and the slides though. So I'll 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 try to keep them up big as much as I can. Okay, I'm not sure if it's true for everybody, but for me, the this is readable, but previously wasn't. It just barely crosses that threshold of like the pixel density on my monitor. Interesting. Okay, good to know. Um, just a quick XML question. XML supports lists, right? So, like, why is dimension order here a string literal and not a list? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, so yeah, OME TIFF is a way of formatting TIFF files that takes advantage of the fact that you can have multi -page, a multi-page TIFF file, so you have multiple planes in one file. And oftentimes it's useful to have multiple resolution levels of an image in one TIFF file. Um, and then they also have a bunch of metadata that's formatted in their particular way. That's essentially in the TIFF header, it's in the TIFF tags, um, and it's, it's XML formatted, which as Davis pointed out, most people don't know off the top of their head. Uh, well, 
I wouldn't say that most people know JSON either, but I would just think that if you are putting metadata for an image in XML, you would know it. And so the, I don't understand why the OME people, just looking at this pixels field is very weird. I, like, I'm guessing Davis that it's because it would be more verbose to represent. It's not, it wouldn't be a list. It, it would be nested elements uh, and the order of those elements would be preserved. But there's no list. Uh, so there, is, there, is, there is no list. Yeah. Is that, uh, okay. So th this is a much more terse way to represent it is my guess. So moving on to ZAR in general, if you're not familiar with ZAR, um, it's a chunked file format, meaning that you can represent n-dimensional arrays as individual chunks, which if you're using a file system as your storage backend, there'll be individual files. And those chunks are located in, those files are located in folders, uh, which are themselves located in folders called groups. Um, so you can you have you can have basically a directory hierarchy or tree um, with various metadata files scattered throughout um, that are sort of meant to hold different things. Um, and this .c adders metadata file um, can pretty much go wherever and hold whatever arbitrary metadata you want it to hold. Um, so OME czar is just a way of formatting czar according to like community standards that are approved by OME. Um, and basically an image is a czar group. Um, the scales or resolution levels of a multi-scale image are stored in that image group as separate arrays at like the top of the hierarchy within that image. Um, and then it outlines certain conventions for naming folders or chunks, uh, or folders and chunks. Um, and then the dot zatters metadata file is kind of strictly specified. Um, so that's a super brief overview of all of these on. And if there aren't questions. Does it have, like, like, does it have advantages over reaching like HDFI or something like that? HDF5 sucks. <laughs> uh, HDF5 has a um, one reference implementation, which is the C library. It doesn't work on the cloud. It doesn't support um, parallel writes. Um, and so Zara, you can parallel write and read. Yeah. yeah. And then does it allow compression? Or? Yeah. Each, each chunk is compressed individually. So it was basically, I think, inspired by looking at HDF5 and trying to get the good stuff without the nightmare of the, the implementation of HDF5. The price you pay, though, is that instead of all your chunks living in one file in HDF5, uh, now all of your chunks are in different objects in storage. And so you may have many, many, many files. Uh, but on uh, computers, it represented as one file? Or? No. In your computer, so there are SAR backends where you could represent it as one file, but the typical way of doing SAR is one file per chunk, which can lead to hundreds of thousands of files and an, an, an unhappy file system. Yep. Yeah. So, that, so it's like one folder. Yes, but that would be like like, like using the OS to copy that. The OS might you shouldn't do that. Yeah, you shouldn't. <laughs> so how do you do it? Then? You do that and you wait, yeah. or yeah, <laughs> or you use a like good backend or yeah, efficient backend. Yeah, just dragon uh, will be unpleasant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So tying two points that Davis made together, the parallel write feature is a really important one that Zara has that HDF5 does not have. Uh, and it's specifically that design choice that each chunk will be its own file that allows the parallel writing. It, so that, that parallel write to get keep it with for a long time. From multiple processes? For multiple processes using MPI. Okay. It's just not technology that's very friendly to the way we use do parallelization here at Geneva. Yeah, or pretty much anybody outside of a HPC, like a government HPC cluster. Yeah, so, well, for, I mean, the this is designed for kind of the DOE labs and CERT and entities like this. 
a very different architecture than we do yeah. um, and operate at a much larger scale than we do and have much more centralization of architecture than we do. But it's something that we don't use here. Yeah, and just more broadly, people don't use, regular people don't use MPI. MPI is not a, it has not been a successful model for parallelism and it's just not what anybody uses. So people need to use something that works with their tools and the parallelism in HDF5 is not one of those things. It's been my observation that MPI is heavily used in C and C++ programs, parallelizing jobs over threads, but all executed in the same machine. Uh, but the type of distribution that I typically do on a cluster, it's hierarchically sort of one layer above that. I'm not distributing using threads on one machine. I'm distributing, distributing using completely different computers to handle different yeah. parts of the task. But MPI is a thread based. MPI is process based. It's and part of it is that it's usually integrated into your cluster submission process. So, um, it I mean, it. it yeah. I'm going to focus up. Yeah. Focus yeah. up, and we're going to continue. Yeah, just sincerely, yeah. it isn't a model that anyone is using in a widespread manner, and so that's why this. That's why Zar is popular. <laughs> to empirically explain why Zar is popular. One must accept that it's easier to do parallel writes with R than HDF5. That is the most plausible explanation. I think it's easier for us to do it. Yes. Great. Um, we can continue this conversation offline for sure. Um, so you might be wondering which viewers support OME and GFF. Um, there is this, this GitHub page that is. Um, a good reference that the ONG and GFF maintainers made um, with all these viewers here on the x axis. And it's not visible, I think. Oh. We can, everyone can go there, right? Yeah, but we can still. Yeah. It's also for the, yeah. Um, so there's all these viewers here and sort of which features of OME and GFF they support. Um, and the long story short is basically there is no viewer that supports <laughs> every single feature of OME and GFF. This looks like traffic on Route 7, <laughs> like the stoplights looking down Route 7. Uh, and it's the OME and GFF tools GitHub repository if you want to look that up later for yourself. Um, so with that, I'll just jump right in to the demos. Um, the first one is reading OME and GFF in Napari, uh, which is pretty straightforward. All you need to know is that there is a Napari OME SAR plugin uh, that you have to install. So assuming you have installed Napari, um, I made a Conda environment and then I did a pip install to get within that to get the plugin. And then once you have that, um, it's as simple as if you have like a publicly hosted file, it's as simple as just doing Napari and then the URL to the file. Um, and it should show up on your desktop momentarily. Um, and so this is an image that I happen to know a priori is a two dimensional time series with two channels. Um, and this is on the IDR repository. Um, and to view this file locally, um, which I have a copy on my laptop. It's the same thing. I just include this dash dash plugin Nafari OMSR argument. Um, and now I can read it on my laptop. So if you didn't um, download it, you just put in the URL, would this still work? It, ah, okay. Yeah, first, that's, that's, that's the first one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's Nafari. I'm keeping it short and sweet. Moving on to NeuroGlancer. Um, the easiest, so NeuroGlancer is a web page, and the easiest way to get up and running is just to go to the sort of demo instance, which is demo, NeuroGlancer demo.appspot.com. And um, once you're there, it, it's really easy to view a publicly hosted file. You just tell it sort of the file format and the URL, like so. Um, and then you can create a new image layer. 
to view your file. Um, you might have to adjust the rendering controls Oops. to be able to like see the image. Um, but you can see it's here. Um, and we can flip through the two channels. Davis showed me this um, using this little knob. Um, and you can also color the channels in the shader box by like writing a little code to control colors. Um, and that's that's how you would view a publicly hosted OME and GFF file in Neuroglancer. Um, Neuroglancer only supports the latest stable version of OME and GFF because someone requested it and they kind of he kind of added it in. Um, latest version. And then those, if you uh -huh. um, is that the same URL for those both Napari and Neuroglancer here? Yes. Awesome. So it's only one copy of the publicly hosted data and both programs are reading from there. You don't need a separate copy formatted for the reader in each case. No, it's the same file. Awesome. Um, and if you want to view a local file with Neuroplancer, um, you have to like, ex like expose your local file to the web so the web page can see it. Uh, which sounds complicated, but I found it was actually pretty straightforward to do. So you can just, and this tip also came from Davis, you can just use a Node.js file server called serve. And like, if you've already cloned the Neuroglancer repo, then like you all, all, you just have to write this one line to install it, or you can just write a couple lines of code to install it. Um, and then you can just do serve and then the path to the file, and then this dash dash cores option. Um, so in this case, if I want to serve this file on my laptop, it'll, I, I just put in that one line of code and it, it tells me now, okay, I'm using port 3000 to serve this file. And I can just put that into Neuroglancer um, like I did with the publicly hosted URL. Um, oh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna move on. Uh, the VLab also has a branch of the Python Neuroglancer thing, so that it's just a command line you put like Neuroglancer dash dash file to so the local file and then the data set, and then you don't have to do that other stuff. Um, and you can generate a URL that you can view, but it's like a shared URL, so if anyone else has the link and you move, then it'll also move to them. So it's not a shareable or as usable for sharing, but it's just if you want to view a file. And also there's like a, a way of configuring NRS where like any file in NRS can appear as if it's stored on like a local S3 compatible storage backend. And so what that means is that if you get that configured for your lab, then you don't even need to run the serve function. You would just type in like S3 and then whatever the, the name is of the host that's exposing everything as S3 style. And then just like the path to NRS and you would see it. So I think this could be really cool if labs get into it. They wouldn't have to do anything. Ken would just like turn it on. Um, and then your data would, if it's data that you want to be shared with people, you would just save it in that folder and it would be exposed over the S3 protocol internally in the building. And Neurogancer would know how to deal with that. For people watching on YouTube, NRS is the system within our compute cluster. Explain cores. I can't explain cores. I don't know. <laughs> it's been explained to me multiple times, and I always forget. It has to be. You have to be. It has to be on for it to work. I think that you're giving Neurogancer permission. You're giving the the file server. You're telling the file server that some website like Neurogancer is allowed to make a request to another domain to get the stuff, because Neurogancer is at some domain. And then Neuroglancer is going to make a request from another domain, which is where the files are coming from. And you're telling the files, you can be requested by some other domain, I think. I don't know. It, it has to be on for it to work. That's yeah. all I know. So that's yeah. where cross origin would be sort of shared, right? I think that because the problem is normally you don't want 
in JavaScript in your web page to be talking to some other server um, because that's been a security problem in the past. But in this case, we do. <laughs> and so was there, there's also a client side thing in, in your browser. No. no. It's just the, on the server side. Yeah. I see. And if you want to host data in an S3 bucket, you also have to configure cores for the S3 bucket. And for me, because I don't remember any of this, that's just copy and pasting whatever I did for the previous one. Cool. Um, so let's move on to writing or saving. Um, so saving. Right, before we move yeah. on, it seems like the right time to ask. For labs or projects that are hosting large data sets publicly at Genelia. Are they hosting them on internal resources on S3? Like if, if I'm if I want to do this, I want to put a file into OME, you know, OME NGFF format and host it publicly. Um, there's what Davis mentioned, that's sort of public within Genelia only, right? Or you have to be on the VPN in order to access the file system to see it. But if I want it to be like world readable anywhere, I just, uh, are most labs uh, like building their own server in the lab to host it on, or are they putting it in S3 and exposing it that way? I think the first thing you described you can't do because all the, if you had a server in the lab, it wouldn't, by the construction of the network, it wouldn't be accessible to the outside world. I think there are ways, but they are discouraged and not widely used. Right. I think like, like FlyEM has a bunch of data that they make public. And I think they have servers in the DMZ mm. that are, so, so then they're like, and I don't know what the, what the, what resources internally they can access. Um, but for CellMap, we just have it all in S3. And we, we do sort of two things. We have a S3 bucket that is, uh, or an S3 account where we don't pay for the storage. And that's because we got this open data grant from AWS mm -hmm. that, that could disappear, like if the wrong person gets fired at Amazon, like we might be on the hook for paying for the data. Um, and then for other things that we don't necessarily want to be super public, we do some kind of like things that we don't want publicized. We'll do like some privacy by obscure or security by obscurity thing where we have some buckets in the Genelia S3 account or AWS account, and then I'll just upload stuff there. Uh, so like we do that when we're sharing stuff with collaborators and we don't want to mail them a hard drive. I'll just yeah. like, I have a bucket I use or I'll make a new bucket and I'll put the data there and then we give them a URL to it. And that's worked great for us. Okay, cool, thanks. I, th I think if there are ways that you can host things using our internal infrastructure, but it's not common and that's not really what it's meant to be for. Um, and so most people will just put their images in a repository if they don't have a lot. Or if you're a giant team project, you can either use the Amazon grant or broker a deal with some cloud service. Yeah, I can say Flylight also has their data on S3 through the open data thing. Uh, I just want to say one thing, which is security oh, yeah. by obscurity is very dangerous and we shouldn't rely on it if, if the PI has the expectation of, of you know security for their data, like it's pre-publication. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't say we like rely on it and there's no private information. It's more like we just want to get a data set to our collaborators. And uh, so there, there's other ways to do that. Like yeah. this is really good for that. But we want to share a NeuroGancer URL with them. Oh, I, I can't, you know, I mean, yeah, your answer it works the way it does. It requires public data. Yeah, well, well, I think it can do authentication, but we haven't configured that with the S3, and it would require, I think, that the people get an S3 account, which they may not have. But well, we haven't worked with anyone who's been super paranoid. So I wouldn't even say security. I would just say it's obscure. So somebody who's, like, scraping our, you know, whatever bucket is attributable to us and is public, they could find this stuff, but I don't know what they're going to do with it. Uh, as an alternative, can't you do the other thing you suggested, Davis? Use the uh, like S3 spoof that Ken has set up and then just give VPN credentials to the collaborator? I don't think we're giving VPN credentials to collaborators. But that happens, that's happens very, a lot. very difficult because they're very strict about it. I have I tried to do that with my collaborators and it's it was such a pain that I didn't pursue it. I mean, I'm sure it can be done, but it's very painful. 
Yeah, so in principle, all NeuroGlancer needs to do is give you a username and login UI element, and then it will forward that to the right authentication provider. And so there are NeuroGlancer backends that receive that authentication. So that would be the, the big boy way to do it. It's just like set up an authentication thing and you require collaborators to make an account, but it's not a big deal. And this, this is the price of your data not being public, but still accessible via the internet. We just haven't set that up yet because we haven't had anyone who wanted it. What about just the users? Oh, yeah, IDR exists. I mean, this is the this is the repository that uh, Virginia needs to point it to uh, and grab this data from. And this is something that is public and hosted by a link that you can upload your data to if you want. Um, a nice thing about IDR is that it has this HTTP front end that lets that serves the data, like streams the data in this way. Um, that is nicer than things like Figshare or uh, Zotero, not Zotero, Zenodo. Zenodo, which requires bulk downloads of everything. So if, if which is weird because those things yeah. are probably on S3, yeah, which so, has the HTTP support. Exactly. So we, I, I hope that one day those services will support something like this too. But at least today, IDR is pretty nice for stuff like this. But it hosts like certain kinds of data, and probably you're not going to put like 100 terabytes on IDR. But I have to say, IDR is pretty highly curated. You can't just put anything. There. You can't just put anything. It is highly curated. That yeah. is arguably a good thing because <laughs> it yeah. also means that things are yeah, fine but, where you want. But it's not like a Dropbox. You it is not a Dropbox. Share yes. uh, there's something pretty similar um, called file image archive run yeah. by Envil and CI. Or, yeah. um, and it's very similar to IDR. It's for usability software as well, but it's meant for more general image drops. Yep. Like, say, I just want to comply with nature methods or nature's um, data share. And I just want to drop some images there. Okay, so reining it, reining it in a little bit, even though I would be delighted to keep talking about um, data workflows. Um, so yeah, let's move on to writing and saving Millimeter um, GFF files. Um, basically, saving is hard um, because if you're writing lots and lots of files, you basically need to be able to do it in parallel. And um, whatever program is doing the saving, it needs to deal with things like permissions and available disk space. Um, so if you're trying to save a file in your file system, like it needs to interact with your file system. Oh, I'm not making this thing. Um, so Napari can save some layer types, but not all and it can't save metadata. Um, and this is kind of a topic of discussion on the web. Um, and then NeuroGlancer just doesn't save stuff. You can save the view like the, in the URL, like whatever like knobs you've turned basically get put into the URL. So you can just send somebody the URL for the view. It doesn't save stuff. Um, so I found Again, with Davis's help, um, three ways to write OME and GFF that are just like tools that are designed to do this, this one thing, pretty much. Um, so the first one is called NGFF Converter, which is made by Glencoe Software, and it's basically a GUI wrapper for bio formats. Um, and so here, if I want to uh, Convert an OME. I'm going to convert an OME TIFF file uh, on my laptop to OME and GFF. Does this have a pyramid? Like, is it multi resolution? We'll find out when you convert it. I'm just curious. I just want to see. I don't think so. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, and then if you want to like add arguments, there's this help menu that basically shows you the command line arguments for like bioformats. Oh, they worked really hard on this. And um, <laughs> <laughs> you can like type those into this extra arguments box. Wow. Um, I, I feel like the only two things that I would care about would be, does it correctly interpret the dimensions and the dimension order, and does it 
let me configure the chunk size. And I didn't readily see like obvious command line arguments for that, but I'm sure they're in there somewhere. Um, but in any case, you can hit the run conversions button and it'll convert. Um, can you go to where it's going to produce the output? And can we look at, I just want to see specifically the multi-scale metadata. Um, yeah. I can go. That is, that is what it puts. What's it shouldn't be. Um, well, oh, I guess it is. I got this data set from this web page. Um, oh, I need to edit sample data, and it's this one right here. So I, I guess it has our own. I don't know, it didn't say anything. So anyway, yeah, it's a little funky. It um, it saves the metadata as an XML file within the czar hierarchy, which is unzarish, uh, but that's maybe more of a failing of the spec than of the tool. Um, and it, yeah, I don't know why it has this funny a. What's inside? Like, what's inside the metadata for one? Like, I'm just wondering, is this thing? Because I think. The spec doesn't allow you to not save a pyramid. At least that was my impression. I thought all images had to be saved as a multi-resolution thing. But I guess the maybe for HCS it's that's weird. This shouldn't be an HCS. <laughs> so I think Glencoe Softwares and JFF Converter was making the assumption making some assumptions about this data set, um, that it thinks that it's a high HCS plate, but it's it's not actually. Uh, is this open source software or commercial or what? It's open source. It's it's bioformat, it's, it's a Java tool. It's yeah. Oh, it, the, is the GUI stuff open source? It is open source, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I should think so. They're very tightly connected to them. So, okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. Um, the next one is the OME czar Python library, um, which like has this one uh, help page you can go to to learn like a tutorial on reading and writing OME and GFF images. Um, so, in this case, I have a um, I have an environment with all the requisite Python stuff installed, and I have the same OME TIFF file here, um, so I can start up Python, import various packages, and basically what the tutorial recommends is like using the TIFF file package to uh, convert the TIFF file to a NumPy array, and then you can save the NumPy array as a czar file. But the, the package doesn't have a function, it just does that? I mean, uh, the, not from what I can tell in this tutorial. Huh. Um, so what I've done here is I, I made the TIFF file into a NumPy array, um, I happen to know a priori what the dimensions are and their order. Um, and then I tell Czar, I'm, I'm sorry, this is probably small on your screen. Um, and then I tell Czar, I want to create, I want to use my file system as the storage backend and I want to create a file with this name. And so only at this final point here, when I get to this write image function, am I using the whole MD Czar Pi library. Okay, so Python does have lists. So axes equals the literal string TYX. Come on, guys. I don't know. This is, this is, 
anyway, this is what they chose. Um, and so you tell it the access order and you tell it the chunks, which I chose kind of arbitrarily here. Uh, and then it writes. It didn't return anything? It returned. It returned an empty list? Yes. Okay. Um, and so I can go into this SAR file I just created and look around. And in this case, it did automatically downsample and give me some resolution levels. So can we look at the, meta, the multi scale metadata? I just want to see if they actually got the. No, they didn't. Oh, no, they didn't. Oh, my God. When you downsample, there's also a translation. Depends on how you downsample. I, I'm pretty sure they downsampled I'm pretty sure the way that it adds the translation, and they should be explicit about it. If it really is zero, they should put it in there. Yeah. This, this drives me up the wall. Like, okay. Yeah. The thing that I noticed about this is that if you actually go into one of these resolution levels, the chunks are laid out, like the dimensions are in the chunk name, and the chunks are laid out in like a flat structure. Um, which is actually consistent with OME and GFF B0.1. Um, this is how they tell you to save it. Um, but in the current stable version, which is 0 0.4, um, they tell you to save the chunks in like a nested directory structure. So even though I installed the latest stable version of OME ZARPI, it's actually saving according to the B0.1 version of the spec. So this is a degree of freedom when you save when you save a ZAR array or when you create a ZAR array. So I would guess that if you did this again, but in storage options, you put in the string dimension underscore separator equals oh. then the slash. Okay. That should because in principle, ZAR is abstract over what the name of a chunk is. Um, and so it happens to be that if you say the, the dimensions that form the name of the chunk are separated by slashes, well, in a file system, that makes directories. But you could also separate them by dots or underscores. Those wouldn't make directories. Um, but is the OME ZAR spec uh, mandating rest of directories? I believe it is. So this tool shouldn't allow you to do this. Yeah, and even the tutorial didn't do that. So. Yeah, this tool should be pretty opinionated and it should raise an error if you try and do this. But it, it's also, I mean, I don't know what the spec says. Does the spec say must or does it say should for this specific thing? Because I know they have these examples, but the examples are not authoritative. The authoritative thing should be the body of the text that says what is allowed and what isn't. Um, and I offhand, I don't recall. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. It says they are stored with a nested directory. Yeah, I mean, this is the other thing that drives me up the wall is just not being, not having clear language about this. And just even doing this as commented pseudo directory tree layout instead of actual text. Like this appears a lot in the, in the spec that there's some example and the example contains comments, but those comments should be in formatted text with headings and everything that's linked. Uh, all right, well, we're cutting into John's time. <laughs> so, we're like, we're all good. <laughs> I am enjoying this discussion a lot, and it's actually good to know that that's a czar thing. I mean, that you should tell czar about the dimension separator. I, I mean, think that I, I don't remember what the default is. I, I just, I was just following the tutorial, and that was what I got as a beginner. Um, and I, I agree. I think I'm a little, I'm a little disappointed that that's like the default way. This version two of the czar spec lets you do the dot or the slash. Um, so the third tool is this one called NGFF czar. Um, That's big language. From Matt McCormick and Tom Birdsong. Um, so this is actually not an OME project. This is just a couple of citizens of the internet who decided ITK. Uh, Matt McCormick yeah. is the lead developer on ITK. Well, it's not an OME. Yeah. Yeah, it's not OME, but this is a big group. This is just a random guy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, but still, I mean, they just, they made an NGFF writer, which is impressive because they, they didn't have to do that. 
Well, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just that's why I think it's interesting that Kitware, the company behind ITK, which has hundreds of software engineers doing a lot of projects, would take an interest in this is really fascinating to me. Wait, I think it's that, uh, like, yeah. sure, real quick, because I mean ITK, like they've been in uh, involved in the discussion of the spec, so like I'm, they have an interest in reading and writing stuff in this format. So I think they want it internally. Like I, I expect that. I mean, all of their C++ code will support this stuff. And I mean, I haven't looked at the code, but I hope we kind of might imagine that this is a uh, like ITK slash C++ code with a Python uh, wrapper. But this is something that we can discover later. But, but yeah, the Matt McCormick has been active in discussions about the spec. And yeah, like yeah. John said, he's got a vested interest in ensuring that ITK is relevant in the future of bioimaging, which is Python at the moment. Um, but also they did kind of have to do this because the OME tools are inadequate. They're not up to the task. And if he wants stuff that composes well with his ecosystem, he's gonna need some IO tools that users can actually use and that he has control over. So I think this is a perfectly reasonable, reasonable decision. Yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't have said like citizens of the internet, citizens of the bioengineering community. Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> And so, yeah, it's based on the ITK stack. It uses Dask under the hood. I'm not gonna demo it for the sake of time, but it's just a command line tool. You don't have to go into Python. You don't have to write code. You just do NCF, NGFF czar, input file, output file name. And there's um, like, you can put in certain arguments like, oh, here's my transformations I wanna do. Here's the dimension order. Here's the chunks, whatever. Um, and it also has this nice UI um, that kind of, you can even just use it to like inspect a file and see the metadata in like OME and GFF language. Um, so it's quite nice. Um, in conclusion, uh, of the three tools, here are my beginner judgments. Um, I felt like the NGFF converter had a nice GUI. But if it fails, which it does often, um, it's hard to troubleshoot because it's just really, and there's like a really complicated Java stack underneath. Um, OME Zarpy works if you're willing to write Python code, um, but also begs the question of like, if you're, if you're already writing Python code, like how much more difficult is it to just write your own? library as davis did and as matt mccormick did like i didn't want to write my own i wanted to be lazy and just use their code but it was you know not fit for purpose um and then and then the third tool might be the goldilocks between like a nice plug and play gui and like a straightforward um you know easy to troubleshoot transparent kind of python backend uh, but honestly i felt like it was Maybe the buggiest of the three. All three were very buggy. <laughs> um, none of them could convert my HTF5 file. They were all inconsistently able to convert non OME tips. Um, but it's also like this tool is being developed right now. The last commit was like three weeks ago. Um, so honestly, I'm like most optimistic for this one. Like it works surprisingly well considering that they're literally building it right now. Um, the tools were so bad, should we be using the file format at all? Great question. <laughs> um, and I think Kaivish kind of hired me to look into OME and interface with them. And I'm honestly not like super, I don't have a super strong position of like, I think this is where the future is headed. I, I'm still kind of exploring. Well, so I, I use R uh, often and I don't subscribe to any file format conventions within czar. I just save arrays in any way that I want because 90% of the time I'm I'm the one looking at the data or I'm uh, directly contacting the person who's working with the data and I just give them specific instructions on, on how to work with it. I'm interested in conforming to this stuff because it's at least like the most visible public agreement on how to store metadata and how to format things. The tools might not be, I, I, I would just as well not use any of these and just make sure that the way I write my stuff out in Python conforms to the standard. Um, I guess that means I have to update if the standard updates. 
Um, but uh, I'm interested in the file format, even if the tools are buggy, as an answer to Don's question. I think like some of us here are developers, but not everyone that uses this is a developer. So I think where the tools are lacking now are for developers. Like I, I expect that Greg could relatively easily write something that writes the metadata in this way that conforms the spec. But if you know my biologist colleagues just need to write their tips to to these file formats, they're gonna have a hard time using this today. Supposed to be a reference. All of these RPI is probably the most referency. Yes. A black screen, yes. Let's try something else. So, in, in theory, those two tools can write big, yeah. They would the, the command line would need to expose a way for you to provide a path to a scheduler, and then you could do it, you could do it on a compute cluster. I don't know if those if either of the two tools with command lines do that. But if they're using Dask, then yeah, in principle, they're using some data structure that you could compute on the cluster. Yeah, about this stuff, I just got up like the uh, side of the screen is surprising, so I can make sure that you all can see stuff. Okay, good. And things look good on your end. I mean, you can see the terminal okay, and you can see PG at like the X is like half readable. Yep, all looks good okay. to me. Thanks, guys. Uh, any last discussions before I start? Ready. All right. Cool. Oh, I will add one comment, which is that the OMI NGFF spec is still in its very early days. Like it's version zero point four, and it's like this is all kind of an immature ecosystem. But they're still writing papers about the format. So in in regards to Don's question about like should we be using this? Yeah, that's the face. Zero five is like soon. That is the correct face to make about that situation. Yeah. <laughs> I guess like I will. Well, can I like? Are you give time? Like are you around? Do you, you don't have anything at two? I guess I'd like to ask you stuff, but I don't want to do it now because I want to kind of get through this and then ask you stuff. Cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about what like the Java ecosystem looks like here. Um, Semi disclaimer is I wrote some of the stuff that I'm going to show, um, and the, the the other tool that I'm going to start with called Moby is like shares some of the code with the code that I write, and like they're friends of Jamelia. So for example, if you where is the paper, um, there's yeah here we go. So like many of these people are friends of Jamelia. Constantine Papo was here for a long time. Kimberly Mitchell was. I, she hasn't been here, but um, Anna Kresha, Christian Tischer are um, all at Emble, for all Christian and Constantine are. So um, they wrote this tool for a particular purpose, and it's the most mature tool for uh, interacting with OMI and GFF in the Java ecosystem right now. It does a ton of other stuff that I won't talk about, but I'll just talk about actually reading and writing with this format, with this tool. Um, so first, let me show you how to install it. It's a PG plugin, which, um, but it's not shipped with PG. So to install it, you go to help, update, uh, PG things for a quick second. And then if it's up to date, you go to this manage update sites. You scroll down to the M's where there's gonna be a Moby box, uh, M-O-P, 
Tap it stop. Here we go. You check this box. When you check it, I've done this already. It's going to just say, here's some stuff I'm going to install. You click OK twice. You restart PG and then it's installed. Um, and when it's installed, there will be this Mobi thing here with some options. You can also like, type Mobi in the search bar. And then there will be a bunch of options here. Um, you can also type, for example, czar. And you can see like these, some of these are going to be Mobi options. Say current images are open only czar, blah, blah, blah. All right, cool. Um, first, let me just save this image. Uh, onto my local hard, hard disk. So this is just some 3D image. It's not very big. Um, and just to emphasize, like the metadata that I'm going to look at mostly is going to be the pixel spacing. So I'm just going to change these so that it's a little bit clearer which dimension is which. Just make that 1.4, 1.3. Uh, say OK. And now let's say save current image as elements are. Um, I could also have plugins will be, and it will be create, save current images of the dark. Um, when you click this, something pops up. You say where you want to save the directory to and what the name of the image is. I'll keep these by default and just click OK. What if you don't check default output, output parameters? I'm going to show you that in a second. Okay. Yeah. So it like mostly instantaneously wrote something. Um, we'll look at does our attributes, you see CYX, it made two scales um, and it downsampled by two. Um, Translation. Translation. We'll have to see if they actually, maybe they need to do I don't know, they might need a translation. We can tell them that we can adjust it. So um, we wrote something, you had better be able to read it. Let's just make sure you can read it. Open, all these are, all these are from file system. Now I'm just gonna click the directory that I just created, select, uh, and it popped it open right away. Um, and something that I happen to know, well, it reports to us what the voxel dimensions are. So this is correct for scale level zero. This is correct for scale level one. Um, and I think we're gonna verify that. Like if you look at this part of the Fiji window, it tells you what the physical and pixel units are. So this is like 313 in physical units and 252 in pixel units. Um, and this is a big data viewer window. And you see up here the physical units. And indeed, it's using the physical units, the correct physical units for this. So, so did, can you go back to the affine? It looks like there was some translation added to the affine. Uh, no, this is just the, the scale one. Yeah, this is scale one. So, so this is scale zero. But go down to scale one. There are more non zero terms in that affine matrix, right? Yeah, you're right. So it basically invented, it, it hallucinated some stuff that wasn't in the metadata. Yeah, so it should have put that in the metadata too. Yeah. Cool. We'll, we'll tell them. That kind of implies that if it, I mean, does it hallucinate something? If there's something, well, whatever. It, yeah. yeah, that's a bug. So yeah, it should have put that in the metadata. It's, it's likely displaying it correctly in this window, but should have written that in the metadata. But just what I worry is since it did display the right thing, does that mean it will ignore that metadata if it's actually there? We don't, yeah, we don't know. So that's something to check. Um, good. I want to show you the not default options. Um, and I'm just going to change the like scale pyramid and the and something else there. You think it infers the translation from the scale? Yes, so that, that would be my guess. Is, yeah. That's what like our tools used to do that, and I hated it. And, and so I don't want to do that anymore. So uh, I'm going to uncheck default, export parameters, and then another window is going to pop up. Let me change the name of this custom. Um, and now it just asks me for more information, like the subtype like factors. So let's make three scale levels. I'm going to say downsample by two. And then let's, let's do something where let's go 884 or something. Yeah. Uh, and then here we'll do, we'll just another 64 cube and then go here. 64 cubed and then, I don't know, 32, 32, 16, something weird. Hopefully I got all the brackets right. Click OK. It broke three levels, which is encouraging. Let's see if it did. Uh, custom. Attributes. So scale level zero, scale level one downsampled by two, and I said 884. 
So this looks like it should be four times down sampled that one, four times down sampled the pen, twice down sampled, which looks about right. Um, and then we'll just make sure that we can open that one. Okay. All these are our file system. Is it custom? And here it is, Meta, uh, like at least the physical metadata left correct. It at least does that much. Um, there's one more thing I want to do, which is like a slightly more challenging image. Um, so those were 3D, and let's do a 5D image. So this one is two channels, uh, a bunch of time points, and a few Z, like Z slices. So we'll do this one with no VPN. We'll say create, save, blah, blah, blah. Well, this one, my tosis, this time we'll just stick to the average, or the, the default export parameters rather. I'll say OK. It just writes some stuff. And sorry, it wrote something. And uh, let's look here. So here we have time, channel, space, space, space. Um, this, this is, I think it's a little bit weird, but this is the the time axis maybe shouldn't have a zero scale, but whatever. Make them aware of that. But let's also make sure we can open it. It's like scale zero. So yeah, what's going to happen when it opens it? So um, if you know like Big Data Viewer, it, like one nice thing is that it did infer it learned that there were time dimensions. Um, and that there are two channels, so I'll just actually color the channels so you can see them. But did it not correctly infer that the time scaling is zero? I don't know what it did about the time scale. Yeah. So it had this is like reporting discrete time. I don't know. Uh, I don't do much with time series, so I don't know if it knows what time. It, what I guess it can't know the time scale because it didn't say it. Say it's like zero time. So then they're all the same time. Yeah, but, but because it just says like zero is like a default. It's one should be the default for a scaling. Yeah. Because that's describing yeah, the time one could be one second or one. No, no, that, that's supposed to be a scale factor for downsampling. So that means that the output will be that number times yeah. this, the previous spacing. So if it's zero, you're saying that we're collapsing everything into one point. Yeah, it shouldn't be zero. Um, I gotta, I'm going to move on, but I just want to point out that there's a ton of other stuff. Um, How's the S3s are? Oh yeah, I do want to show you that actually. Here, oh, so here it's let's do open OBZAR from S3. Um, I did this earlier, but this is some. This is like a platinaris. Like, can you try one of ours? Uh, I know it doesn't work. With oh, OBZAR. okay. Yeah. So I know this doesn't work with one of ours. One of uh, yeah, I don't think this works with one of ours, but like this one works, and like I will have to ask them. Uh, what I did, what I should say also is. Um, we made a Moby project using some of our data mm -hmm. at that point, but pointing to our data like through this, at least I don't didn't work when I tried it. Earlier. Okay, but like so that was I, I wanted to use I wanted to use OMSR, but yeah. the only way to read it in BG from S3 didn't work. Yep, and that's been holding me back. Yep. So yeah, this is like still a limitation with BG now. So now I'm wrapping up with what exists. In the Fiji ecosystem today, um, like imminently, um, I wrote stuff again. This is stuff that I wrote, and disappointingly, it's not ready yet. But it, like, does some of this stuff. So, um, in a second, I will show you what things will look like once they're released. If you are really burning to write something today, you can go to this page, which I'll link to on the wiki or something. Um, Essentially, all you need to do is grab this jar and dump it into your Fiji plugins folder, which I've done already. I'll show you. Uh, plugins, I think I call it something patch. Nope, wrong one. No, I just dumped this jar into this, uh, into my Fiji. Um, and then you can save files as uh, as MGFS, but they're quite simple. Again, this is like only only use this if you're burning to do this today. What you should do is wait 
however long it takes for the Fiji bureaucracy to move and for me to get my act together to release this stuff. And then this will be shipped to Fiji directly. But again, if you're burning, you can all use the same, same guy here. So. so you say Fiji bureaucracy, what is that? Uh, I'll tell you in a second. Let me just like the, uh, say that then you have, right? A dialogue pops up and you can, um, Um, here, this will fill in with the number of dimensions. So I'm going to leave this like this, and it's going to say 64 cubed, but I could do something like 6432, and it'll be 643232. Um, I'll do it like this for whatever reason. Here's the number of scale levels you want. Um, in the future, this will have more options. I'll uh, be right where you can like determine exactly how you're downsampling and so on. Um, it's going to grab the metadata from here directly, um, and I'm going to say OK. Should be done. Uh, my adders, uh, here it is. I order it XYZ. Um, I didn't change the scale, so here it is. And I can tell you for a fact, Davis, this does not introduce translation. Okay. Um, and I am like anal about that, so you, <laughs> you shouldn't trust me, but I will tell you that I will be very. I just think the well. spec should force you. Yeah. Should not leave it optional. Uh, and then I do want to show you the, I'll just show you a zero theory, just so that we see the chunk size. Yeah, so yeah, 32 or 64, 32, 32. Uh, is, what's the chunk size of? Like, what, what is the chunk size of? Uh, can I defer that to later? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, like pretty much it breaks the image up into pieces like this and each file is going to only be okay. Right, right, okay. and it's the size of that. So why is it, basically. when it says like you're giving it three numbers, what is it with a different, um, it resolution? has to be a cube because this is a 3d image. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, I see. Okay. okay, cool. Um, good. So that is what you can have exist today. If you want to just install a jar into your 3d, which again, I don't super recommend. Um, but I'll show you like what things might look like in the future once this is released. And this is just unreleased, but mostly ready code that I put into this special PG. So um, for example, um, N5 viewer is like the big data viewer wrapper that I write. Um, there it is. Uh, you can also go to plugins, big data viewer, N5 viewer. And I'm just going to open up some of the stuff that we've looked at already. So for example, we'll do this one, which is the first one that we wrote. Um, and while we're here, again, for the purpose of this demo, I'm dumping out the metadata that it sees just so that you can like be sure that it sees it correctly. It's there. Um, you can see here the sizes of each data set. And um, if an item in this tree is bold, it means you can select it and display it. So this means I can select the multi-scale uh, array here, click OK, and it opens it as a multi-scale image. And yeah, you see that, again, this should be about 300 and something um, in the center of this image. So it, it didn't even use the right amount of data. So how did you downsample this? Like, um, I'm not averaging. I'm just grabbing uh, pixels. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to show one more thing, which is, yikes. So some of Davis, Davis kindly put some data on S3, and I call it here, and this is just so that I can copy the path to it. That's where it is. Um, you can look at that with n viewer also. Dump that in there. It, here it's like talking to S3, it's looking and parsing. It found some bunch of stuff. It determined it's multi-scale, drops it there. And um, it's like actually open. So this is like, this is not, um, it's not being super good with the multi skills actually. I might have some work to do, but this is something that isn't possible with N5 viewer now. So you can open ZARs on S3 in the current release. Again, it's like coming imminently. So um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. And I think that's going to be it. So we should just, we should talk and wrap up. Um, all right, thanks everyone. And I'm going to plug plug. All right, if you're interested in ONG NGFF at, at Genelia, um, 
check out the NGFX channel on our email address Slack. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So looking backwards, um, I think we can we talk to Dan. So he can get the camera. Yes, I was just trying to say Yes, I love it. Rectangular prism not cute because the sides is of each side don't have the hyper rectangle. Hyper rectangle. Go to n dimensions. Yeah. Um. Who's supposed to be writing these files? Files? Yeah. Well, who's supposed to be writing NGFF? Only authorized NGFF file writers. I mean, anybody can write. Yeah, you can write know, but, it if you want. But who's the intended user? Someone who wants to save their data in the format. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm just trying to think from Dan's perspective of the why he, what would motivate him yes. to, to do this. So I, I have to get it So for Japanese multiple different scopes, they all write different yeah, formats. So what I'll usually do is I'll just, uh, I have one format that I like that's the shell, which is HDF5. So I'll just, put, I just try to make everything the same, like whatever scope it comes out. That way I can stick it in the same pipeline. Because I know where the metadata is. Because if I go to one scope, I look at the tip, no metadata. No, oh, it's saved in an XML. I'm going to click the tip, right? Stuff like that. But can I write my pipeline? Can I write a pipeline based on your HDF5? No, probably not. But it works for me. And I don't really care about game, right? So, you know, just be fair. That's your prerogative. So the, the thing about I love about HDF5 is very fast. Like, I almost treat it like RAM. Like, in the sense that I can scroll through an HDF5 file on, um, using a red room. And I can quickly see what's happening. And I don't have to look at it. Things like this. But I agree, I can't parallel process, which is another really big thing. But usually when I'm just using a laptop or something like that, your write speeds are, read and write speeds are not that great, right? So if I parallelize it, I'm not sure I'm even going to get that um, jump in productivity. Yeah, like if you don't care about other people, you probably don't care about this. So I guess one prerequisite to using a community format is caring about other people. <laughs> <laughs> it's ZAR, right? So, it's ZAR. so should I consider using ZAR rather than HDFI? What's your chunk? What's, what's your chunk size today? I don't know. I, I have no okay, because like that's one of the degrees of freedom of your HDFI file. Yeah. Um, and it's possible that you use really big chunks, and then you wouldn't really notice. The effect of those chunks being in multiple files. Um, for like, I can just say for us, HDF5 is simply not an option because we have multi terabyte data sets that we want to put on. Like, we want people to be able to access from cloud storage. Yes. And HDF5 is just not good at that. Um, but if, if all your data sets are like 100 megs, then. It's HDF5. Yeah. I mean, just keep going with HDF5. Okay. Um, but something that is, I think, missing from the OME NGFF effort is a story for people who want to use the data model but want to use HDF5. Because in principle, the data model is abstract of any particular file format. And so you, you should be able, if you like the data model and you like the metadata, you should be able to implement that on HDF5. I think it'll benefits of HDF5. But then you would, if you wanted to, like leverage the ecosystem of tools, assuming there ever is one, you would just have like one adapter that's like, pretend my HDF5 is the czar. And then you get all the NGFF tools. That's the outcome I think would be nice. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get there. I completely agree. And I think that's what my tools will look like. Is, yeah. I mean, you will be able to write this kind of data yeah. whatever back in it because of like, yeah, our tools don't care if it's czar and five HDF5 and it's going to write the metadata there however it can. Dan, the other question I had is what, what kind of computer systems are you using to do this? I usually, I usually don't just do things like a right. laptop. So what's your, drive. what is your laptop running? It looks like a PC, not a... Yeah, yeah. So are you using Linux? That, yeah, I'm using a bunch of it. Yeah. You're using a bunch of it, okay. Um, how about other microscopes? Well, microscopes are all Windows because yeah. the software. Okay. So you have Windows-based microscopes and then you're transferring it to your local hard drive on on a bunch of you laptop. Yes. Or is there like a workstation involved or do you use a oh, you my laptop or okay. um, yeah. like another thing, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but the, the saving aspect is like still kind of difficult specifically when there's large amounts of data. So I again I think like 
most of the people in this room and like looking at you, Greg, could write the code that parallelizes the stuff over a cluster, but like the user facing tools aren't going to have this be easy for a long time. And I guess like maybe a question for you, Dan, and you, Brian, if you care to answer is like, are you guys converting, like resaving or processing stuff in clusters now? And do you have like file format woes as a result of that? So yeah, I usually I don't use the cluster. Usually usually don't use a cluster, so you don't need it. Okay. Yeah. Same. Like, like I, I'd be I'd be perfectly happy if it was clear like to follow a protocol, like you know, a set format for these things, but I I don't see that here. <laughs> yeah, it's, right. It's not very obvious to me. Yeah, I completely agree with what uh, Davis and John already agreed to that. And um, OME NGFF HDF5 should almost be taught before OME NGFF SAR. Like, I really, the, 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 the abstract like file format is useful in any hierarchical data, any hierarchical file format. So, I, I suggested this, and there was pushback. People do not want the data model to be separated from the file format. That's really weird to me. I don't, yes. I don't get that. Yeah. I wish but completely sabotages but the Made my right? head explode when I heard that. But there's also mm -hmm. the star thing coming sometime, some month, I don't know, in the in star V3. I, I think I that know. that's I think that's harder for like to convince somebody to use this format is like I, Zara, was, Zara was born out of big data necessity. So if you're not using big data, then ZAR is just a, a complication that you don't need to learn about. So I, I think that making ZAR even more complicated by including another layer of, uh, between the blocking and the actual file, the sharding, has engineering benefits for experts who are using the format already, but it's not going to make it easier to recruit users who just want an easy format that any reader can read or write. And I, I think that the idea of OME NGFF, but using HDF5 as the as the actual file is a great way to do that. I'm surprised that there was so much pushback. You should have you should open an issue on the OME NGFF GitHub page where you say that. David is getting you in trouble. Just say it. <laughs> say it. Say it. You think there should be a separate data model. And I'm just curious to hear what other people say. I'll Don't give you comment on it. I'll give you a little yeah. thumbs up on GitHub if you do that. But well, all right, I'll think about it. <laughs> I mean, the, the one thing that I have to tell you, Dan, is that you absolutely should not convert to AGF up on your Windows computer with a Microsoft Windows. Yeah, okay. You're going to have a very bad time because it's not going to, it's going to add time for when you try to move it around the Windows system. It's slower on Windows and you're going to have a hard time copying that AGF up off Windows. Yeah, I mean, like, like sometimes I have like 30 or 40,000 TIFF files. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll convert that to HDF5. I can move that in seconds. Right. But if I try to move all those files, it yeah. takes hours. Yes, exactly. Now, yeah. imagine you're going to break each of those TIFF files into, you know, hundred or a thousand files each. It's going to be you know, slower, yeah. right? And um, and part of that's Windows, but that's something that has to be answered here. Yeah, like Windows is real, so yes, we can't exactly. just we can't just pretend Windows machines don't exist. Yes, they absolutely do, and I think they're absolutely <laughs> in the intended pipeline for who we're supposed to use this, but we don't have a good answer there today. Yeah. I think there's potential answers, and we need to hurry up on that. Yeah. Bring it done because I wanted to ask, like, what you're using, at, like, basically what your needs are, and like, who are you using Zar so today? I all? haven't read or written a Dimitri file in years. Okay, so you're not like the audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I did know that you know, for example, Porta Cloud is about to have OSP Zar support. Yes. So it's kind of interesting to hear more about. Okay. Um, can I offer an answer to that question? I write czar files every day um, for expansion microscopy on whole brain zebrafish. Sometimes it's image data, sometimes it's deformation vector fields. I would love to be able, and right now I'm just treating czar like a container and I save no metadata. It's just all in the scripts that created the file. It's all very dirty. Because I, yeah, that's what I said. I think it's all in the old bean. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that some of my tools are starting to pick up more users, and I would like for the outputs to be readable across viewers like you guys showed today um, in whatever ecosystem. And so I, I'm probably going to use this. 
OME and GFF. Um, I'll probably use the Matt McCormick one just because I use a lot of other ITK products. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't intend on teaching my users about this format so that they will begin saving their own images in this format. I just want my tools to save results in this format so that they can view them right away without doing any additional manipulating. That's my key uh, reason for wanting to pick it up. And public sharing, I'm interested in that too. Um, yeah, eventually once a project is published, putting some of those data sets in a public location. So great, where do you write a GFF? Currently I don't, right now I just save a ZAR file and I take all my answers. Can you repeat, Mark? I can, can't hear where you. Where do you write your ZAR files? Did you say where or how? In where? Or or just on the Genelia file system, NRS. What's that? You use a cluster. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing would be someone who builds a microscope, maybe Brian is close to that. Yeah, I want to know because I mean, I, I want to. Okay. I want to basically be, uh, you know, be part of the future and see what yeah. what I want should be like. Well, what, what, file, right? what file format do you use your microscopes? Right. They're all, they're all, they're all, and this would be embarrassing, but they're all TIFF. They're all from Micromanager, basically, but they're all some some TIFF form. And then so, I mean, I'm saving super huge data, so you know it's. Compare that to say, I just, because I, I, I just started writing some stuff to take CZI files as input. And, um, you know, Zeiss is a microscope manufacturer and they have to save data. CZI, I think, is just like an HDF5 file with its own custom metadata format. And mostly I'm opening LightSheet microscope images, but th there's no reason that CZI couldn't be a ZAR file it could just as easily be a ZAR file and have all the exact same functionality it currently has and be no slower or, uh, or worse off for reading or writing than the existing uh, HDF5 file. You can have a ZAR file with huge chunks, for example, and then you don't have a lot of these problems with copying a ZAR file or deleting a ZAR file. You just save every, like for mosaics, which is what I'm usually taking off of the Z1, Every tile is saved as a separate chunk. That's usually you're not collecting more than 30 tiles. And so 30, 30 files is easy for an operating system to deal with. So Zeiss is doing what OME and GFF is doing. They're just doing it with HDF5 and their own chosen metadata fields. But OME and GFF is essentially the, a, a, a parallel type of effort just using a very scalable, friendly file format as the backend. So I guess what I would say. I, I mean, we did have a conversation with Slice and we talked about this and they seem to be very worried about performance um, issues when writing the energy of them. Um, and this is something I've encountered too with the color lab. Um, that, you know, you, you know, definitely writing small chunks is going to be a big problem. Um, writing large chunks is technically challenging because we need to buffer more data and so it becomes very difficult to do that at say full frame rate uh, full fps of the camera um, i think different uh, situations because you're talking about 4d imaging right mm -hmm. Like where you actually have a frame rate um, and like streaming, saving things in real time. I'm talking about like uh, imaging one large 3D sample. Uh, and then I think buffering is less of a problem. Like the microscope's not producing data faster than the computer can compress and save it, no matter what your chunk size is. Well, even for volumetric imaging, because you have a large volume and you want to do the whole thing very quick as quick as possible, um, you know, that could also pull you back. I know, I think when we talked to the site, it's kind of what they wanted was something that's going to work across the entire product line. Yeah, you know, it couldn't work for most of the systems, but not their high performance. They wanted one thing for everything. 
that could be. I feel like that could be Zar, right? Because you, it just depends on what compression algorithm you choose, how much compression, and what your chunk size is. Like there has to be a suitable set of decisions, both for small, fast acquisition and large, slow acquisition. All with yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't quite get this because data is always chunked when it comes off the scope. So there's like nothing about Zar that forces you to have a, a ton of chunks. Like a TIFF file is a chunk. It's always chunked. So there's nothing about Zar that makes performance bad. It's only when you want to do massively parallel writes to little regions that you get a lot of chunks. But like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, hey, the, I mean, the bottom of that, OK, basically, you probably could come up with a star file that has very large chunks, effectively. The chunk that's large is the, the camera frame, or bulk camera frame. Right? Sure, yeah, that's not yeah. that big. But the camera frame is a couple of minutes. Yeah, but you want a stack of camera frames, so let's say 500. Well, the, the camera is yeah. giving you one yeah. frame. Yeah. So but, that could just be your chunk size, right? right? But the where you get encounter the bottleneck on Windows is there's overhead to opening up a file. Right. And so you practically only want to open a new file once a second. Like whatever this constraint is, it would be a constraint for any file format. Right? Uh sure. I think you're basically access frame in terms of chunk size. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think basically, yeah. I mean, basically, I think the shard could solve this kind of issue, um, but we don't have anything. As far as that. But, but like this would be a problem for any any file format, right? Sure. And they have an internal solution that yeah. you know, it's not an issue of file format, by the way, but it is somewhat similar. In, but I wouldn't like worry about what Zeiss does because they're literally never going to use an open format. I think that's their objection. I mean, I don't want to be too much of a cynic, but I would guess that's their objection is to using something like OME and GFF is that it's not built here and it's not proprietary. Yeah. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if in four or five years, Zeiss released a CZI 2.0 file format that was OME and GFF, just with a bunch of additional proprietary metadata fields stayed in the stored in the attributes. And, and specific decisions made on chunk size based on how the acquisition was scheduled on the microscope. So like we're gonna chunk a, a whole tile at once or we're gonna chunk each plane at once. And I, I think that just like, um, like LSM file format, I know for sure is just an HDF5 file. Uh, they use the HDF5 library to write them uh and you can use hdf5 tools to open them inspect metadata fields interact with them uh i, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was also true about czi uh, files and i wouldn't be surprised at all if, they, if they, they use this open source stuff as a foundation to create something more specific for them later but they also don't want to say that it started in the open source community they want to say that we built it ourselves I don't know. They, just I gotta run in a few minutes, so like we can wrap up, but like we can also continue without me. But uh, I guess like. Well, thanks. <laughs> I gotta go too. And thanks, um, John and Virginia. You guys saved me a couple of weeks of digging around and have, have convinced me that I, I should be writing. I use R all the time, so it's a no-brainer for me to, to start con conforming to the standard, which I think I will be doing. Nice. I guess. Well, to the community. <laughs> yeah, it's, which it's something. The more people join, the better we can get. Yeah. But like, please say something on GitHub if you have opinions, because there's like a there's a tendency in the decision making for people to let bad decisions slip through and into the spec. Uh, that has happened. So we will leave comments and thumbs up and rocket ships. Yeah, rocket ships. I like the, uh, I don't know if it's on GitHub, but I like the bouncing rainbow sheep on Slack. That's my, I, I feel is the highest form of compliment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.